I invite us to open our Bibles to a New Testament text by the Apostle Paul, written to young Timothy, as we like to call him the preacher boy that Paul was discipling and directing and training. Second Timothy, the fourth chapter. Second Timothy, chapter four. In a moment, we'll look at three very brief verses in the center portion of that text. But as you are turning there, perhaps you recall at some point, some of us are old enough that we can still recall back in uh, grammar school or high school or junior high school or even in the college level, uh, perhaps where we were involved in some athletic uh, programs, uh, some in the 100-yard dash, the 440 uh, dash, uh, or something of that nature where we had, uh, we were running. And I never will forget back in uh, school, the few times that I was there for the athletic events, uh, I say that simply because, uh, and I will admit to anybody, and my bride is aware of it, that uh, I had work on my mind throughout uh, uh, school, and the, as soon as I could find a way to find a mid-time of the day to uh, cut class or skip class or whatever, and I don't recommend it to parents with kids, by the way, I'd uh, thumb a ride over to one of the grocery stores or the shoe store that I worked at and uh, would make myself busy working. But on occasion, I'd watch the sports uh, activities out on the uh, campus in the sports field and our junior high and high school. And uh, a lot of folks love to be participate in the athletic events and the running. Uh, and it was an amazing sight to see, and perhaps you've watched it on the Summer Olympics or the Winter Olympics or other Olympian programs by way of television, or perhaps as a spectator or participant in those, uh, some of the games of that type. And some of those that would start out very rapid, out of the gate, uh, would just run, run, run. A couple of laps later, they're falling behind. After about five or six laps, uh, uh, they're the last one in the lineup. Those that started out perhaps uh, uh, a little uh, more cumbersome in their speed or a little slower in their approach uh, wound up being first rather than last in the lineup. You've perhaps watched some of the things called Daytona 500. That's boring to me. Some folks will sit all day long watching Daytona 500 or one of the other uh, uh, sports cars, uh, sports car races or NASCAR races and get a lot of joy out of it. I don't. Uh, I like to watch, watch preaching on television. I like to be able to talk back to the television and the one that's uh, uh, talking with some of the her uh, heresy on the heresy broadcast networks. But nevertheless, in the NASCAR races, the same is true. Uh, they'll start out uh, real fast and act about four or five laps if they've not had a wreck or roll the vehicle. Uh, many of them will wind up being 10th, 15th, 20th, or 100th in the lineup as they cross the checkered flag, the finish line. So also in our lives, many times I've found down through the years, individuals say yes to Christ, uh, follow the Lord in believer's baptism, be involved in every service every time the church doors open, and we look at with great glee and gladness, we look at with great joy and excitement to see that new believer in Christ really getting involved in the study of God's Word. More often than not, three months later, Six months later, maybe a year later, you couldn't find him with a CIA search warrant. Somehow there's a mindset that I've got my insurance policy. <clears throat> I've tucked it away in a lock, lock box someplace, and uh, it's my fire policy, and when I die, I'm going to heaven. Well, we have a problem with that biblically. Uh, it's not just an insurance policy. It's not just something that we uh, buy now or that we receive now, and by and by we'll get the benefits from it. There ought to be an involvement in your life and in my life to run the race well and run the race with the idea of winning the race and winning the crown, the reward for the race. Stand with me as we read the Scripture out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. The Apostle Paul writing and speaking, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his 
appearing. Thank you, and we may be seated. I've asked the question a number of times to a number of people, Christians, especially Christians that have been saved for a while, involved in serving the Lord for a while. I've asked the question, what kind of legacy would you like to leave? What is it you would like others to say about you, your family, friends, relatives, neighbors, acquaintances, et cetera, et cetera, even your enemies, after you've died and gone on to be with the Lord? What is it you would like said about you? I'm reminded of the young climber that at the foot of the Alps, a little small chapel. This is a true story. A little small chapel at the foot of the uh, Alps uh, where uh, uh, a climber had died, and he's got a little headstone there, said he died climbing. He died climbing. Uh, I have said for a number of years, and my bride can tell you, that that is my aspiration, of to die climbing, still serving the Lord. I talk with a dear pastor friend of mine, have a good conversation with him, 30 to 45 minutes an hour, every August the 10th. Why August the 10th? Because that's his birthday. And I've had the privilege of knowing him since about 1959. He was uh, my, one of my mentors, the main one that challenged me so much from the Word and was so dedicated to the Scripture. He is now 87 years old today, completely blind. He has no uh, central vision, just a peripheral vision, and he is still pastoring. I uh, asked him, I said, well, what are you, <laughs> uh, today I said, what are you doing? And I'd forgotten that last year I asked him a very similar question, and he is at uh, a little church about 31 miles uh, west of Thompson, Georgia, and uh, he's pastoring there. Uh, it's just a church. They've had services only on Sunday morning for 25 years. Uh, he said at one time they had about 100, 150 in attendance in the past uh, 20, 30 years because as they have put it in the church, all of the young folks have grown up and moved away and has just left all of us older folks here. And uh, he's had the privilege now of two years of pastoring uh, that church. He has uh, pastored probably 10 or 15 churches in his ministry. And he's always had the ministry mindset that when he comes into a fellowship, he'll take one that's disheveled and broken down and very little activity, and uh, it seems that there's no hope for the church, and he will come in and uh, minister and reach out, train the people, grow the church, and when it's to the point where it seems, well, it's really thriving and a place that a normal pastor, an average pastor would stay, he says, I've done all I can do. I brought it back to uh, a level of thriving activity, and he'll resign, go to uh, go on down the road someplace else. And uh, he retired from the post office as a postal carrier. He has had a long ministry and loves the Lord. But I look at that as having uh, lived and served a uh, life that you could say when he goes on to be with the Lord that he has fought a good fight. He has kept the faith. He has finished the course, and uh, hear the Lord Jesus say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. That ought to be the mindset in each and every one of us that we have the idea that we want to finish well. Finish well. And that's what I want us to think about uh, for a moment, finishing well. And there are three things that I want us to notice in these moments together. I want us to notice, first of all, the relinquishment of the present. There are several things that's important in finishing well. The relinquishment of the present the reflection of the past, and the recognition of the promise. Notice what the Apostle Paul said in that uh, sixth verse, for the little Greek word gar, because I, have, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I want us to notice where he looks at his fate, as I call it, F-A-T-E. He says, for I am now ready to be offered. Now ready. What does that mean? He sees his destiny. He sees his fate. There's nothing more to be done. He's done all that there can be. He's ready. Literally, he's saying, I'm ready to be poured out as a sacrificial offering. Keep in mind, the Apostle Paul is in the Mamertine prison when he makes these, uh, uh, when he makes this statement, when he writes these words. He is looking at it on the basis that I've done all I can do. I have uh, come to the point and place in my life that I know that my days are numbered. I know that the time is close for me to go on to be with the Lord. Now, there are those that will say, "Why, well, uh, Pastor, don't you realize that everybody doesn't look at life that way? Don't you realize that we don't all look at it on the basis that I might go on to be with the Lord tomorrow? Why not? Why shouldn't we? It's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. That word a point in the Greek text in the Hebrews 9.27 text is literally at a point in times past, God has predetermined a precise date that we will be born into this world and a precise second when we leave this world. It's appointed unto man wants to die. And there is no such thing as being uh, simply those that are old will die. 
the mindset when we're growing up, 10, 15, 20 years old, is that when you get old and gray-headed, white-headed, or no hair, then it's time for you to die. Uh, I had, uh, have had for some time a serious interest in the epitaphs on tombstones. Back when I was in full-time evangelism, traveling all over the nation and having the privilege of being in some of the old churches with the old uh, cemeteries right up to the uh, wall of the front door of the church uh, during some times when doing prayer and meditation, waiting before services for me to preach, I'd go out and just walk.